Hello, I'm Alessandra Kelly, professional fine artist and 17th century Royster Doyster. Everything humans do is art, and that art changes over time. There are things that we think of as true, normal, eternal, maybe even a solid entrenched law of human nature. But sometimes things are not laws of nature, not ingrained ways of humanity. If they're only fashions, then they can change at the speed of fashion. And it doesn't matter if they've been that way since time immemorial, whatever that means. No matter how solidly entrenched a belief may seem to be, if all that keeps it going is social pressure, it can collapse in a relative instant and be forgotten. And sometimes we don't even notice. With that said, let's talk about smiles. You know, smiles. Big, open, happy grins showing the teeth. Almost laughing. The universal signal that this person is happy, trustworthy, friendly, and likable. Except it's not. Where does this sound? Smiles like this were not a thing in Western art and portraiture before the 20th century. And then in two short decades, they transformed from a disgrace to a commonplace. Wait, a disgrace? Yep. Nowadays we see smiles and laughter as signs of trust, friendship, and warm positive feelings. But they weren't always viewed like that. For thousands of years, teeth-bearing smiles were seen as a sign of danger, and laughter was associated with criminals and con artists, the untrustworthy, the shameless, the untutored, and people with intellectual disabilities. Laughing out loud, even just showing the teeth, was simply not done. Historically, Western audiences seem to have viewed visible teeth as creepy as hell. And yet, after thousands of years of strict social conventions about smiles and laughter being a bad thing, right around 1900 it all got swept away and forgotten. Why? Why did this happen? Let's take a look. If we look back to Greek and Roman art, as most later Europeans did, we'll find very few smiles depicted on regular people. In fact, it's noticeable how you never see anything close to what we think of today as open smiles. We're not even sure these are smiles. You don't see Greeks grinning. You don't see Romans laughing. You may see a few little smiles, especially on certain gods as children. You'll see occasional flashes of toothy smiles on theater masks, satyrs, and other grotesques, although more often you'll see big, gaping, open, toothless maws. There's like one respectable statue even showing teeth, and it was lost at sea thousands of years ago and looks like it was a one-off experiment anyway. And most importantly, it's not smiling. It's not like the Greeks and Romans and later peoples didn't laugh. They had senses of humor. They made jokes. They enjoyed comedies. They smiled. We know because they tell us. They just seem to have felt that it was shameful for respectable citizens to show amusement or delight in public life. In all their official portraiture, in all their art, they are nothing but grim, placid, solemn, and tight-lipped. And then for 2,000 years, Europeans imitated that. Emotions were improper. Passions were animal. Through all the canon of Western art, for centuries upon centuries, you'll only rarely see smiles and never laughs. You'll barely see any teeth or even open mouths. If someone in Western art was showing their teeth, they were either dead, distraught, or disreputable. Once you start seeing this, it's everywhere. Respectable white European people were always depicted with serenely blank faces. They rarely smile, they don't laugh, and the only time you'll see them exposing their teeth is if they are in utter terror or despair. Except sometimes if they're dead. It was okay to show teeth on the dead. All of this was simply a fashion. It wasn't for any practical reason. Europeans did not, as some people have claimed, hide their smiles because they had bad teeth. Archaeology shows us that most people had pretty good teeth before the 18th century, which is when chattel slavery made made sugar super cheap and readily available, and Europeans discovered tooth decay and eventually dentistry. It's another myth that they always depicted themselves sober and solemn because smiles were hard to hold for any length of time and hard to paint or photograph. But this is silly. Any artist worth their salt can capture a rapid expression. Of course artists knew how to paint smiles, and we do have old photographs of people smiling, usually folks who weren't let in on the social convention that you weren't supposed to. Respectable Europeans could smile, they just didn't where people could see them, mostly. Or did they? Who are these guys? Well, let's back up a moment, because as you may have noticed, I've been saying it's respectable people, folks like kings and burghers, ladies and saints, who didn't laugh or smile in Western art. So were there any people who did? Well, yes, as a matter of fact. And here's where it gets interesting. Visible teeth in Western art, until very recently, were a signifier that the people present were of the shameless, the untutored, 
the disreputable, the foreign, the non-white, and the dead. If adults, they were likely to be on the outskirts of society, probably low status, and probably something shady was going on. These are carnival masks from a medieval chivalry, worn the way some people today dress up as grotesques for things like Halloween and Mardi Gras, a combination of shock and humor. By the 17th century, you started getting a lot of paintings of openly smiling people. These scenes look normal and pleasant and inviting to our eyes. But when you look closer, they're all about sin and shame, either children too young to know better or folks doing crime. Pickpockets, sex workers, gamblers, drunkards, dishonest servants, seducers, and other shady types. Why is this 17th century cook smiling? Look closer. She's making a deliberately suggestive gesture with that chicken and that skewer, and I wish I were kidding. I thought I'd found an exception with this cheerful painting of a domestic childbirth celebration by Jan Steen, but nope. A closer look shows the clues. Someone's making a cuckold sign over the baby's head. The smiling woman is holding her hand out for money from the man holding the baby. And as a major clue, the broken eggs in the foreground are symbols of lost virginity and seduction. So yeah, in old art, big smiles are always a clue that there's a moral judgment going on, and the smiling character is the one cluing us in to the immorality. Smiles were considered so shameful that in 1787, on the very eve of the French Revolution, when court painter Elizabeth Louise Vigée-Lebrun exhibited this absolutely innocent self-portrait with her little daughter, French society lost its mind. This was the big 1787 scandal that riveted the attention of the French court. That's how shameful smiles were considered. Vigée Lebrun, however, was a statistical blip. Smiles didn't catch on, apart from maybe her near contemporary Boy here, who was a student of physiognomy and expression, and he was something of an outlier. Teeth and laughter in art were still out of the question, unless you were a high as a kite maenad, or someone throwing Christians to the lions, or, well, foreign slash non-white. Teeth remained the province of weirdos, disgraces, and flirts. Oh, and actors. And then right around the year 1900, everything changed. Within the space of a few decades, barely a generation, big smiles, which had been frowned on for millennia, stopped being seen as sinister and suspicious and started being seen as normal and friendly. So what happened? 2,000 years of seemingly established, immutable, rock-solid tradition vanish in a relative instant. Well, let's look where it happened, right at the end of the 19th century. Something about the late late 19th century changed how people thought about people, about smiles and teeth and laughter and shame and respectability and what's normal and what's right. Because of the timing, at first I thought maybe it might have had something to do with the rise of psychology. But then I read some contemporary works on the theory of laughter and smiles and... Uh, they were all old-school nasty. For example, in 1900, French philosopher Henri Bergson wrote that laughter's main function is punitive, a socially enforced shaming and punishment of the immoral, the non-conforming, the unattractive, the awkward, and the disabled. Clearly, these theories are not part of the social change that was going on. So what did change? I think a good part of it was women's rights, and part of the reason I think this is because smiles were, and in some respects, respects remain very gendered. It began, as so much does, with Scandinavian avant-garde artists, and it was women who led the way. In 1881, when ladies dressed like this and society looked like this, Danish artist Bertha Wegman painted this absolutely gorgeous portrait of her friend, roommate, for God's sake, historians, her partner, the artist Gianna Bauck, smiling and relaxed in a way we see as perfectly natural. But it's not, and this is important. This painting breaks all the conventions of what women were supposed to look like and act like in 1881. At the time, you only saw women smiling like this if they were actresses or on naughty postcards. Sure, Bauk is an artist and thus still not exactly part of respectable society, but she's smiling and the painting treats her with respect and she looks great. A few years later in 1897, Swedish painter Anders Leonard Zorn painted this 100% absolutely respectable American society made Patron, relaxed and showing her teeth. She's only half smiling, but even so, it's revolutionary. It's about the earliest socialite portrait I've found, someone wholly within the bounds of respectable society, not an actress, actually showing her teeth in a formal portrait, and no one objects. This is new. This is daring. Other society women
women followed quickly. In the early years of the 20th century, more and more women had their portraits done with their teeth showing. Not always smiling, but... but teeth. Right through the first two decades of the 20th century, you had this invisible revolution. In a relative eye blink, in less than a generation, they became normal, ordinary, everywhere. By 1910, toothy smiles were semi-respectable, even if they still retained some aura of naughtiness. And the, uh, the super fans showed up. <clears throat> French painter Émile Vernon, for example, had already made a career of soft focus, colorful portraits of pretty girls. But right around 1910, he started giving them really noticeable, sharp focused, toothy smiles. I mean, it takes all kinds and it's mostly harmless, but it's also kind of hilarious that it happened pretty much the instant the toothy smile became socially okay for women. By the way, this is also when you can start telling imitation historical paintings from real ones, because later painters could not resist adding the newly socially acceptable, but still slightly naughty smiles. There is no way these paintings were made in the historical period they depict. You can tell by the smiles. Men's smiles lagged behind women. You didn't really see men begin to smile in pictures until the First World War. And something about that still feels weird and uncomfortable to me, like it was a deliberate choice to put a jovial front on a super grim business. Formal painted portraits of men are the one art I found where smiles are still rare to this day. Illustration and advertising being more cautious and conservative than the fine arts lagged well behind them in accepting smiles and laughter. The earliest commercial toothy smiles I found are from about 1905, and they are the most timid, teeny tiny, clenched, barely there, unwilling to commit, micro curved, lip parted crescents imaginable. Feels like it took a while to convince advertising people that smiles were nice. Hollywood and advertising may have helped make broad, expressive smiles acceptable for men as well as women, though it took some time. By the 1920s, you see a stronger expectation that people will smile. Women are seen smiling and laughing regularly by then. Pretty much by the 1930s, smiles and laughter were seen the way we see them today, as a natural part of everyday life, genuine, joyful and warm, trustworthy, friendly, and authentic. Which folks just a few decades before would have considered beyond comprehension. After just a few generations where that scene is normal, people have completely forgotten that it was ever otherwise. Things can change that fast, and that completely. Any fashionable idea can collapse even after millennia of being socially enforced, of people saying it's an eternal truth. Sometimes something that seems as simple and fundamental as never laughing, never even smiling, is just a fashion. So yeah. Thank you. 